My name is Kathleen Sprose Cummings. I'm the director of the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism and also a professor of American Studies and History here at Notre Dame. I'm excited as always to see so many friends of the Kushwa Center here, but I'm even more pleased to be able to welcome those of you who may be joining us for the first time. Thank you very much for coming. I especially want to thank our co-sponsors for this afternoon's lecture, the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture and the Clow Institute for Civil and Human Rights. Since Martin Marty delivered the first Kushwa Center lecture in 1984, this annual lecture has provided an opportunity for the Notre Dame community to hear from noteworthy scholars on topics related to religion and public life. This afternoon's speaker is no exception. Dr. Maureen O'Connell is Professor of Christian Ethics in the Department of Religion and Theology at LaSalle University. She holds a BA in History from St. Joseph's University and a PhD in the Theological Ethics from Boston College. Her books include Compassion, Loving Our Neighbor in an Age of Globalization, published by Orbis in 2009, and If These Walls Could Talk, Community Muralism and the Beauty of Justice from Liturgical Press in 2012. That also won the College Theology Society's Book of the Year Award in 2012, as well as, as, well as first place for books in theology from the Catholic Press Association that same year. Maureen's newest book is really remarkable. It's called Undoing the Knots, Five Generations of American Catholic Anti-Blackness, published by Beacon Press in 2021. It, um, I've never read anything quite like it. I really, um, really had the opportunity to review it um, in manuscript form, and it employs narrative history, theology, and critical race theory. Um, it, Maureen uses that to excavate her own Catholic family's entanglements with race and racism from the time they immigrated to America to the present. Um, so we are in for a treat today. A little more about Maureen's background. In 2017, she was honored as the 44th annual with her LaSallian conference uh, um, at the conference as a distinguished LaSallian educator for the Eastern, the District of Eastern North America, winning praise for her immediate and significant impact among the LaSalle University community. She is a member of POWER, which stands for Philadelphians Organizing to Witness, Empower, and Rebuild, an interfaith coalition of more than 50 congregations committed to making Philadelphia the city of just love through community organizing. She serves on the board for the Society for the Arts in Religious and Theological Studies and the Cranoleth Spiritual Center, a ministry of the Religious Sisters of Mercy in Northeastern Philadelphia. She's also a member of the President's Commission on the Legacy of Slavery at Rosemont College, also in the Philadelphia area. Um, we have Dr. O'Connell here all week. She'll be here participating in the Center for Social Concerns 2023 conference, Justice Sown in Peace. But this afternoon, she'll speak to us on Finding Mom in a St. Patrick's Day Minstrel Show, A Family's Legacy of Irish American Catholic Anti-Blackness. Please join me in welcoming Maureen O'Connell. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. I want to say thanks to Dr. Cummings and also to Madonna Noak. I don't know if she's still here. Madonna, thank you so much for your generous hospitality, making it easy breezy to get here from, um, from Philadelphia. So, and I appreciate everybody being here uh, this afternoon. I, I want to begin first and foremost by um, explaining to you the motivation um, for, for the book. Um, I, I really wanted to try to understand some of the whys behind my own outlook and behavior when it comes to racism. I am blinded by my own whiteness on a pretty regular basis. Um, and I suspected that it had something to do with how the people in my family who came before me learned to navigate what W.E.B. Du Bois called the most significant problem of the 20th century and that's the color line. And so I wanted to learn what might have been handed down to me over many generations of my family's experience of being American and Catholic in the city of Philadelphia, elements of which I suspect Dr. Cummings and I might share in common as another native Philadelphian. Um, so I found myself looking and asking whether the O'Connells and the Gallaghers, the Hargadens and the Smiths, the Carols and the Littles, all depicted in a very one-dimensional way in this ancestry family tree, and I suspect some of you might have family trees that look something like this on ancestry. Um, were we always this way in the United States? And by this way, I mean ill-equipped to recognize and respond to racism. Or was this something we learned? And if we learned it, then who did we learn it from? 
and how did we pass it on? So to go looking for those answers, um, or in looking for those answers, I discovered that across the generations, we got ourselves tangled up in some knots in the color line, some distinctively Catholic knots. And you can see them here. And so these are the knots that I kind of I spell out over the course of the, of the book. But in my time with you today, I want to share three specific Catholic knots of racism that I discovered in researching my family's Catholic roots in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, roots that go back to the 1820s. So my family is celebrating a bicentennial here in this decade, if you will. I want to lift up the Celtic twist of them, given the role that Irish identity played in the mix of that American Catholicism in which my family's members were so, so steeped. And so to do so, I'm gonna move chronologically through three different parish spaces in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia to which my people belonged. That's gonna leave the example about my mom that I alluded to there in that really kind of catchy title at the end. So it's gonna build a little suspense. So mom and minstrel's time is gonna to come towards the end. Um, in each vignette, I'm going to illuminate what the, that particular story from my family's history reveals about the interplay between Irish American Catholicism and anti-blackness, the impact I think it had on my people, and the lasting legacy of that knot, or the ways that we just keep getting tangled up in it. And then I'll conclude by offering a couple suggestions for how Irish American Catholics who desire to undo some of these knot knots might go about doing so. And I hope that that can be a really good point for our conversation. Before we go any further though, let me define anti-blackness and then why I focus on that um, understanding, that particular understanding of racism in the book. When I set out to answer some of the why questions that haunt me, I fully expected the title of the book, and this is what I pitched to my editor, Being Catholic, Becoming White. That's because I assumed I would find subtle ways that my people were able to assimilate into white culture in America, ways in which they learned to leverage their Europeanness, albeit their Irish Europeanness, in ways um, that allowed them to be, to be gradually recognized and rewarded for their whiteness, maybe even despite of that Irishness. And of course, I expected to find ways in which their ability to assimilate into American whiteness came at the expense of others whose pigmentation did not afford them that same opportunity. But I really assumed that their assimilation was a passive process, something that just happened that didn't require much intentionality, and that mostly involved the first arrivals and wasn't necessarily an intergenerational project. What I discovered instead, after digging in parish and archdiocesan archives, was a far more active commitment across the generations of my family to become white precisely by actively and continually rejecting blackness and black people. And I soon realized that active anti-blackness was a requisite for becoming and remaining white, and that remaining white is an ongoing project. So what do we mean by anti-blackness? I find Ibram Kendi to be very helpful here. He simply defines anti-blackness in terms of personal attitudes and institutional policies that assume that there is something fundamentally wrong with black people that they are a problem to be fixed or to be dealt with. Catholic ethicist Katie Grimes deepens this for me by suggesting that anti-blackness involves per pervasively and collectively held beliefs that associate black people with servitude, black people as a threat to personal and collective security, and that render black people's belonging to America, to the Catholic Church, to Catholic higher education, as suspect and conditional. So why this singular focus on anti-blackness in my book? In just about every chapter of the story of my people in Catholic Philadelphia, I learned that most of us regularly and closely interacted with black people, often with a kind of intimacy that I was not expecting or was really surprised by. So this is not to say that other minoritized communities did not experience, experience racism in the city of Philadelphia or that their encounters with Philadelphia's Irish Catholics or institutional church were not also tinted with racism. 
However, as a native of a city like Philadelphia, where the founding fathers gathered for years to declare independence and then to form a government, I feel compelled in this book to name the deeply anti-Black roots of American racism, given our collective rejection of Black humanity from the beginning, and at the same time, our complete reliance upon free Black labor for the economic well-being of the majority of the country's history to date. And we have to include the Catholic Church's history in the United States in that as well. So let's jump ahead to three Catholic knots of anti-Blackness. I want to start with my earliest ancestors to come to the United States from Ireland. They're both on my father's side. The Littles and the O'Connells came from Ireland to Westchester in Chester County, Pennsylvania, which was and still is part of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. And they arrived at what I call in the book a threshold time. Andrew Little likely arrived in 1820, and Maurice O'Connell, my namesake, a little more than 20 years ago. So they arrived in the antebellum period on the threshold of the nation's conflict over slavery. And they also arrived in a threshold location. Chester County is just 20 miles south and west of Philadelphia, which was abolition's keystone city at the time and home to the country's largest population of free black people. And it was also only 11 miles from the Mason-Dixon line, one of the most significant borders in the nation's history since it determined the lack of freedom for more than 4 million people enslaved below it by 1860. So Chester County historians considered Chester County an emancipation borderland or a quote, twilight zone between slavery and freedom, as Lucy Maddox put it. And so when my people settled in Westchester, and you can sort of see it there nestled in the sort of a matrix here of the different lines of the Underground Railroad. When they settled in Westchester, there was continuous movement of black, of black people across the Mason-Dixon line, all of whom were impacted, regardless of their freedom status, by the social death of slavery a term coined by sociologist Orlando Patterson that I found very helpful for understanding the impact of enslavement on black people, even free black people. And there were about 5,000 free black people in Chester County at that time, experiencing the social death of slavery. The Littles and O'Connells lived along one of the busiest lines of the Underground, underground Railroad at the height of its activity. There were 132 station agents in Chester County alone who helped shuttle an estimated 1,000 to 2,000 people through Chester County on that Northeast line between 1839 and 1860. Chester County was also rife with the early skirmishes between abolitionists, free black people, and Southern slave owners and slave catchers who were regulars in Chester County all of which and all these skirmishes involved either resisting or enforcing the 1851 Fugitive Slave Act, which said that white slave owners had property rights to black refugees of slavery and that all Americans had a responsibility to return that escaped property, including my newly arrived ancestors. Finally, Westchester Borough was a bastion of Quaker abolitionists, many escaping anti-abolitionist violence in the city of Philadelphia itself and holding their rallies and conventions in Chester County instead. In short, this was a very tumultuous time and a tumultuous space to begin the project of becoming American. Had I not perused the Black History Clippings file at the Chester County Historical Society, however, I would not have known about any of these aspects of my ancestors' new home. The St. Agnes Parish historical record was largely silent about all of these goings on. There was a lot to read about the fact that it was the fourth parish in the diocese at the time, and that it was founded by a group of laymen, some of them rev from Revolutionary War families, and they established it in 1794, and about how it was the only church of any denomination in Westchester Borough, and how it served, or excuse me, was served by itinerant priests until Bishop Kenrick, we're going to hear more about him next, removed the laymen in charge and named it St. Agnes. But there was nothing about the political moment, all of which involved tensions around black freedom in that parish historical record, except for maybe two things. 
The first had to do with the patriotism of the first permanent pastor at St. Agnes, Irish-born but Philadelphia-trained Father John Prendergast, who married my great-great-grandparents, Margaret Donovan and Maurice O'Connell, in 1856. And a few years later, flew a giant American flag across one of the main streets in the town on which the Paris was situated and under which all of the troops from Westchester marched on their way to employment, deployments rather, in the Union Army. The second was a kerfuffle when one of the itinerant priests who predated Prendergast in the parish attempted to bury a black person, presumably a parishioner, but this is not entirely clear, in that parish cemetery. Anti-blackness links these two implicit references to the political moment in the St. Agnes record. Prendergast was a fervent believer in supporting the union, but not necessarily of ending slavery or ensuring black freedom. And his predecessor had to navigate his parishioner's refusal to be proximate to black people even in death. So why the silence? I found myself asking, why the silence in the historical record of the first Catholic parish in Chester County? One possible reason was pushback from other Irish who publicly rejected abolition in part because abolitionists rejected the Irish and abolitionists themselves were not widely popular with average Americans. So might not have been the people to model yourself after if you're a new American. I found evidence of this um, via the very public stances though of the American repeal societies a network of chapters of Irish Americans funding, raising funds to support efforts in Ireland to repeal the British Act of Union of 18, 1800, which had removed the Irish Parliament from Dublin to London. The repeal movement was led by Daniel O'Connell, the liberator, who ironically appealed to the Irish in America to recognize the connections between the lack of Irish freedom in Ireland and the unfreedom of black people in their new country. O'Connell's commitment to abolition of slavery in the US stemmed in part from his own personal encounters with Frederick Douglass who traveled to Ireland in the 1840s. In my mind, I had him on a ship going in one direction and Morris O'Connell coming across the Atlantic in the other direction because it was roughly around the same time. Um, and so on this tour, he was invited there um, by Irish abolitionists and the liberator, O'Connell the liberator, called Douglas the Black O'Connell. And in his Irish address of 1842, O'Connell called on all repeal societies in the US to demand the end of slavery. However, there was strong resistance to this uh, call from O'Connell. It swept through many repeal societies, including those north of the Mason-Dixon line. For example, the Pottsville Repeal Society in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, also in Chester County, sent a letter to O'Connell that insisted on the natural inferiority of black people, their fitness for servitude, and the happiness that their labors brought to 15 million white Americans, mm -hmm. Irish among them. So being public, publicly pro-black people was taboo among the most ardently Irish of the diaspora in the US, even in Chester County. A second reason for the silence in the St. Agnes historical record stems from the Catholic leadership of the archdiocese at the time, Irish-born Bishop Francis Patrick Kenrick, who was a contemporary of O'Connell's and actually called the St. Patrick of Pennsylvania given his work to shore up the Roman identity and grow this vast diocese that he assumed control of in 1842. Kenrick was a slavery sympathizer. His brother, Peter, who was a bishop in St. Louis, was actually a slave owner. Philadelphia's Kenrick wrote a three-volume moral manual, Theologia, Theologia Moralis, to help train the crop of American-born priests being formed in the newly established American seminaries. One of those volumes was dedicated to the intricacies of pastoring in the midst of the uniquely American reality of slavery. Kenrick built his moral guidelines on the premise that enslavement did not contradict natural law, and condoned practices that normalized its brutality. 
He offered guidelines for catechetical instruction and conducting sacramental rites amongst enslaved populations and detailed ways of assessing the penances of slave owners and overseers. In short, slavery was a system to work within and to moralize about, but not to overthrow. If that's the mindset of your religious leader, then it is no wonder that struggles for black freedom were not of interest to the good people of St. Agnes. So what are the Celtic knots here? First, in Kenrick, we learn that proximity to positions of power exercised over others obfuscates the possibilities of building power with others based on common histories, experiences of marginalization, and hopes for freedom. To my mind, this was a huge missed opportunity in the American Catholic Church. I'm struck by the fact that the early church in the US was predominantly led by Irish-born prelates and bishops. What people were better positioned to support black freedom from Anglo-Saxon superiority in America than those who experienced it in the homeland from which Anglo-Saxism had exiled them? I think my people learned that black suffering, black oppression, and black dehumanization is a given. And the best that Christians can do is to tend to the symptoms of that oppressive and dehumanizing suffering with a missionary posture, one of responding out of charity to meet needs created by disparity rather than to uproot its causes. I can't help but think that the Littles and the O'Connells learned how to compartmentalize black suffering, to rationalize white inaction, or apathy, or even resistance to black freedom, and to moralize about black inequality. In Kenrick, I think we find an early example of cafeteria Catholicism, picking and choosing when moral rules do or not apply, especially since Kenrick flew in the face of Pope Gregory XVI's 1839 ban on the international slave trade. So what's the lasting legacy of this knot? Much of the church's history in America is tied to enslavement, and we're only beginning now to turn and face that honestly, especially the economic and political systems and institutions that supported it, and the theological ideas and institutions that sanctified it. Moreover, while we have a strong tradition of Catholic social thought, we don't sufficiently apply those principles to a variety of conditions that illuminate what scholars call the afterlife of slavery basically pulling again from W.E.B. Du Bois's idea that, and I quote him, the slave went free, stood a brief moment in the sun, and then moved back again towards slavery. Black people continue to fall well below white people on so many metrics of flourishing and freedom, voting, violence, mortality rates, wealth, imprisonment. We have been completely inadequate in addressing these things via our Catholic social tradition and institutions, which to my mind is evidence that so many of our theological systems and institutions are still tangled up by the church's historical alignment with the culture, institutions, and politics of black enslavement. Consider open wide our hearts, the 2018 pastoral letter from the US bishops, one of only four documents to address racism in the, our heritage of American Catholic social teaching. And the earliest of them was written 100 years after the Civil War and a full four years after the Brown versus Board decision. Brian Massingale notes that this most recent pastoral letter, letter fails to even name white supremacy, which is really essential for properly diagnosing the root causes of racism, particularly right now, given the rise of white Christian nationalism and that rise among Catholics, which we're gonna talk about. Black Catholic journalist and author Olga Segura notes that Open Wide Our Hearts and even Francis's much lauded Laudato Si failed to acknowledge the church's own ties to slavery and the racial capitalism it created. In short, historical entanglements with slavery reflect a stunted moral imagination on the part of many Catholics, particularly Irish Catholic leadership in that, in that threshold time and space in which my people first arrived. Those moral blinders got handed down, and we lack moral imagination now about how to understand and respond to racism precisely at a time when it is most needed. So let's jump ahead. Let's go to our second knot and jump ahead to 1926, the year of the country's 150th birthday, or sesquicentennial, or sesqui for short. We're coming up on one of them in 2026, and I don't know what word 
we, how we can, we can get any more cumbersome than sesquicentennial, but we will be in a couple of years. Um, but we're gonna move from the rural edges of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia to one of its most celebrated parishes at its very center, St. Stephen's in North Philadelphia. This is the parish home of my great grandparents on my mother's side, Edward and Belinda Hargaden, who were later arrivals from Ireland to the US. Both came in the first decade of the 20th century. It was also home to their eight children, my grandmother, Catherine, the only girl. This is an ideal setting to explore a second Celtic knot, responses to anti-Catholicism. In 1926, Philadelphia threw a five month long World's Fair scale party to mark the occasion of the country's 150th birthday. A highbrow planning commission worked for more than a year to, in advance to create attractions and, into, and to invite civic groups and associations from around the country to boost attendance. There was one group that didn't wait for an uh, invitation, and that was the Ku Klux Klan, who in July of 1925 had successfully pulled off a rally in Washington, D.C., complete with a march in front of the White House. They were interested in holding a convocation during the sesqui, sesqui, with similar elements but on a grander scale. And while some of the Jewish businessmen on the planning commission worked to undo the initial approval that the KKK's application got from the planning commission, Members of the KK's chapter in Philadelphia were burning, were building energy. I was shocked to find several items in the papers of Philadelphia's Cardinal at the time, Joseph Doherty, pictured here. And I stumbled on this picture of him tucked into a parish bulletin um, or a parish calendar. Um, I, you know, it wasn't anything that was a formally archived. It just kind of it was indicative. I think the way it's just kind of stuck in as a as a bookmark in the in these little um, these little booklets that came out once a month in the parishes. Um, but there he is. I think it's a great I think it's a great picture of him. Um, the Klan was. Um, I, I found I found things in Dockery's uh, papers. He's a first generation Irish American from the coal region of Pennsylvania revealing how the Klan targeted him as a threat to American democracy. And I'm gonna give you a quote here from Philadelphia's Clavern leader who lived in a suburb of, Phil of Philadelphia where my brother is raising his family right now. Um, a, a note that he wrote in his Christmas appeal letter in 1925. He wrote, what are you doing to stop the vitriolic utterances of a paid emissary of the champion bead rattler of the, of the Tiber? Is the faith of your fathers not worth fighting for? Let us build a mighty and effective machine in the city of independence, which will forever crush the ambitions of the papal hierarchy. Manpower means votes. So in June of 1926, just as the sesqui was opening, the pastor of St. Thomas Aquinas in a Northeast neighborhood of Philadelphia wrote to Doherty about how a shrine on the church's property had been burned and flyers about an anti-Catholic rally had been posted in the neighborhood. Until doing this research, I had really no idea of such active Klan presence in Northern cities like Philadelphia and their persistent targeting of Catholics along with black and Jewish people. American Catholic historian Mara Farrelly helps me understand the roots of their anti-Catholicism, which predated the Klan itself, but as that Christmas missive from the Clavern president um, indicates, were still fundamental to Klan thinking. Ultimately, Catholics presented challenges to the collective ethos of America as a white Christian nation, or the commonly shared belief that God intended America and its prosperity for European Christians. Not only were there concerns that Catholics would dilute the native Protestant ethos of America, but more importantly, while Catholics may have been Christian, they were not the ideal American Christians. They were too authoritarian, too monarchical, too feudal, too ready to hand over reason and self-determination for the sake of blind obedience to a ruler in Rome. If Catholics were not capable of the kind of citizenship required by the American Republic, Irish Catholics were even less so. Extreme poverty defined the circumstances of their earliest arrivals, and so native Protestants feared that they had internalized the oppression they had re received or experienced at the hands of the British, and therefore were more suitable for colonization than for self-determination. And their mystical Irish Catholicism amplified the already cultish stereotype of Catholics in the minds of native Protestants. 
So what was Doherty's response to the Klan's threats and violence? When the Sesqui Commission finally disinvited the Klan after members of the Jewish community threatened to withdraw their financial support for the whole affair, Doherty seized the opportunity to put Catholicism on display instead. On an early Sunday in October of 1926, he orchestrated an outdoor mass in the Sesqui Stadium for 250,000 people. More than 80,000 Catholic men from every parish in the diocese and a handful of them from ad adjacent parishes as well, diocese as well, marched shoulder to shoulder, 20 across, three miles down Philadelphia's iconic Broad Street under a giant replica of, this, of the Statue of Liberty and into the Sesqui Stadium. This was quite a spectacle. A massive procession of diocesan priests paraded onto the dais, which had been designed to echo the high altar in St. Peter's Basilica, with Doherty as the focal point. Irish American prelates played visible roles. Doherty is there in all of his glory. A Monsignor Whitaker from one of the parishes in the city offered the homily, and Father McCullough from my grandparents, my great grandparents' own parish of St. Stephen's, celebrated a mass for an overflow crowd of 5,000. There were 5,000 who couldn't even get into the stadium, and he said mass for them outside. I can't help but think that Doherty was gaslighting the Klan with this event he put on display the very anti-Catholic concerns that drove the Klan to burn down that shrine just a few months earlier, lockstep obedience to Episcopal authority. And yet I have every reason to believe that multiple, and I, I shouldn't say yet, I have every reason to believe that multiple members of my family scattered by this time in parishes around the diocese witnessed this firsthand. And yet I can't help but think that Doherty was doing more than just signaling something to the Klan. He was publicly attesting to Catholic alignment with the patriotic values and vision of the country the Sesqui was attempting to put forward, a Christian nation and a white Christian nation at that. Sociologist Philip Gorski suggests that white Christian nationalism has always been a political vision anchored in violence and in racial purity. And I think we see elements of all three um, in Catholic participation in what unfolded that Sunday in the Sesqui. In terms of articulating a political vision in his homily that was printed in full in the city's papers the following day, Monsignor Whitaker assuaged fears of, Protestant counter, of his Protestant counterparts who were worried about the impact that the decline in religiosity in America at its 150th mark might have for the Christian future of the nation. Catholics, he assured everyone, would shore things up with their distinctive and fervent religiosity. Whitaker also signaled Catholic agreement with the role of divine providence in the founding of the country, again, assuring alignment of Catholics with the political ethos of American exceptionalism. And finally, he called for a Catholic renewal of a spirit of high and holy patriotism. This was a political vision for American Catholics choreographed by an Irish Catholic. While black Catholics were not entirely excluded from the sesqui, Doherty's logistics for the event conveyed an implicit compliance with white Christian nationalism's expectation of racial purity. In plans for the impressive 80,000 Catholic man march down Broad Street, again, in which I can only imagine many of the men in my family participated, parishes were instructed to form up on designated side streets to Broad Street and fold into the back of the parade as it passed by. Internal planning memos in the sesqui file in the Archdiocesan archives flagged the, six, the, the city's six black parishes with the letter C, the only such ethnic or racial designation on the list of more than 200 parishes. There were multiple pages. Ooh, I'm sorry, I should have advanced that. Here we go. There are multiple pages. I don't want you to miss that spectacle though. Sorry, I didn't advance that in time for you to see that. That's a pretty big gathering of people. So um, they were the only group that was designated um, along racial or ethnic lines. So Doherty's planners grouped them together on streets closest into the stadium, which ensured that they were at the back of the parade and therefore the back of the seating area in the stadium itself. 
And while a variety of sodalities and other Catholic associations lined the aisle to the dais, and so there that is, right? You can see them all in all of their glory. Um, there was no mention of the Knights of St. Peter Claver, um, which was a black Catholic sodality founded in 1909, just after the ordination of the first black Catholic priest, Augustus Tolton. And interestingly, Tolton was not listed among the Catholic emissaries who were present at the event. And while there was no outward physical racialized violence among Catholics at the Sesqui, I did discover a troubling example of erasure, which womenist theologians assure us is indeed a form of violence for those who are rendered invisible. In April of, 20, of April of 1926, just a few months before the KKK set fire to that shrine up at St. Thomas Aquinas Parish, three ladies from St. Peter Claver Parish wrote to Cardinal Doherty, seeking his permission to contribute to the Catholic exhibit at the Sesqui. St. Peter Claver was historically significant even then. It was the city's first black parish established primarily through the faithfulness of black Catholic Philadelphia families and the financial support of Philadelphia heiress turned religious sister, Mother Catherine Drexel. Surely with this in mind, Rosa White, Gertrude Palmer, and Clara Baptiste Jones twice indicated to Doherty, first in a handwritten note, and a few weeks later in a typed one, that they had been selected to represent black Catholics in the Catholic sesqui exhibit and wanted his advice and counsel on moving forward with that. Their desire to be part of the sesqui on their own terms points to the fact that there were other expressions of Catholicism longing to contribute to that celebration. Doherty twice dismissed them through his secretary, named O'Hara, who scrawled in pencil at the bottom of both letters, these people were to be told that the archbishop does not intend to take a hand in this matter. Again, we can ask ourselves, what is the Celtic knot of anti-blackness here? For one, to loosen the knot of anti-Catholicism, which initially targeted the Irish, as we're gonna see in the next example, Irish American Catholics built common ground with Christians higher up in the social pecking order by rejecting blackness as neither fully American nor fully Catholic. In short, they learned in the words of Noel Ignative in how, to become, how the Irish became white, that to be American is to uphold American institutions, but not necessarily American values. Institutions that have always been designed by and for white Americans. More troubling to my mind, however, is the fact that Irish American Catholic leadership in the archdiocese took advantage of the sesqui moment to publicly and confidently signal that white Catholics might be best suited to play the white Christian nationalism game. So what impact did that have on my people, who I have every reason to believe, again, were there for all of these festivities? I think they learned that the best defense is a strong offense. They learned that the best response to fear is to create an insular sense of conditional belonging, in this case, belonging conditioned by race. They also learned that Catholic patriotism involves expressing the supremacy of Catholicism among Christian denominations laying groundwork for Catholic ascendancy to political power at the national level, which is already experienced at the local level in a city like Philadelphia at this time. What's the legacy of this knot? In Philadelphia, the erasure of those three women from St. Peter Claver Parish was a harbinger for things of things to come. The Archdiocese officially closed St. Peter Claver Parish in 1985, and then 19 years later closed the St. Peter Claver Center for Evangelization that was housed in the property, which is in a very lucrative part of, um, of Center City. Today, descendants of the parish and advocates for Black Catholicism in the city are in the midst of a lawsuit to preclude the Archdiocese from selling the property to a non-Catholic entity in hopes of bringing it under private control. And the outcome of that is far from uncertain, but the wounds of a century of rejecting the gifts of black Catholicism remain exposed and unhealed. On a national level, we see the mixture of religion and racism is an effective tool in politicization and polarization that ultimately allows those in power to remain so by dividing people who would otherwise be able to build coalitions of power around common pains and wounds and dreams. 
In the case of the sesqui moment, Doherty's stance precluded the possibility of building a coalition, at the very least among white and black Catholics, if not with others outside of Catholicism who were also targets of white Christian nationalism a century ago. White Christian nationalism is clearly not new, but it is entering a new phase as, a number, as the number of white Americans declines and the number of those unaffiliated with religion rises, particularly among younger people. Catholics can be found among and even leading those supporting violence as a means of restoring America to its white and Christian roots. In a 2020 article in Sojourners about Catholics involved in the alt-right riot in Charlottesville and the January 6th riot at the Capitol, or alluding or setting the stage for the, art, the January 6th um, riot at the Capitol, Eric Myers notes, I'm gonna quote, the threat is not that white nationalists will take over the Catholic Church. The threat is that the Catholic Church harbors a culture sufficiently friendly to white nationalism that people can comfortably embrace both the faith and the most extreme forms of racial hatred. On this note, Paul Moses of Commonweal raises similar questions about the growing mix of what he calls traditional piety and populist politics in some pockets of American Catholicism. I think my family has been tangled up in that one since the Catholic spectacle at the sesqui. And then here comes our last, our last knot, the long awaited mom in minstrel time. There she is, there's my mom. Kathleen Gallagher on her first communion. We're gonna fast forward about 25 years to St. Patrick's Day in 1950 and out to the suburbs of Philadelphia to a town called Norristown in the suburbs um, where my mother and her siblings spent their childhood. Ironically, I discovered this piece of family Catholic anti-blackness looking for another and add that my paternal grandfather, Bill Gallagher, shown here with my grandmother, Catherine, while on a cruise, and please note every photo you'll see of him, he's got a cigarette in his hand. There's gonna be a couple. Um, I was looking for an ad that he would have taken out to market uh, a subdivision about, of about 200 homes he built and sold between 1949 and 1953. So there he is there on the building site. Richard Rothstein, author of The Color of Law, recommended that an ad would be the best place for me to confirm my suspicions that my grandfather only sold these homes to white families. Rothstein's own research on government-backed housing segregation explains how the, the Federal Housing Administration would have only backed bank loans made to developers selling to white families, and how the mortgage subsidies provided by the Veterans Administration GI Bill were only available to white GIs. So on my very first archival search for this entire project, in search of that ad, I came across this instead in literally the first reel of microfilm I pulled in the Montgomery County Historical Society. The parish that my grandparents joined in Norristown, founded around the same time that their parents likely participated in sesqui events through St. Stephen's Parish back in the city, put on a minstrel show on St. Patrick's Day in 1950 to raise money for a new church facility for the parish. My mom and her Irish twin brother, my Uncle Bill, shown there, were both performers in the first and second grade numbers respectively, like I drilled in on this, um, on the microfiche. And while they weren't in blackface, certainly other parishioners were, given the list of N men, and I'm trying to have an arrow that's pointing to them, that paragraph, and then also the fact that there was an all-male makeup committee. This is probably the most Irish of the knots that we've considered so far. Minstrelsy was a way for Irish Americans to flip the script on racial stereotypes. Native Protestants in the antebellum period which saw the first significant wave of Irish immigrants parried, parodied the Irish while in blackface. This signaled an equivalence between Irishness and blackness in the native Protestant mind and suggested that Irish immigrants and black Americans had more in common with each other in terms of their distinct otherness from native Protestants than Irish immigrants had in common with Protestants by virtue of their whiteness. In other words, initial minstrel shows communicated that the Irish were not white. Not yet, anyway. The Irish eventually took over minstrelsy, parroting themselves and black people, black people whose blackness was a permanent otherness that never permitted them the power to take control over stereotypes about them. 
For the Irish, on the other hand, performing in blackface on the minstrel stage allowed them to claim their Irish identity, Irish songs, reels, musical instruments, as fitting for America by also parroting behind temporarily blackened faces, those whose actual black skins calcified their permanent otherness. According to a minstrel scholar, Robert Notowski, and I'm gonna quote him, by being able to wipe off the burnt cork from their pale faces, Irish American minstrel performers were metaphorically wiping off their racial otherness, end quote. On the minstrel stage, the Irish could be unapologetically Irish and confidently American. It wasn't the Irish who were drunken, lazy, and prone to violence. It was black Americans. Irish Catholics embraced minstrelsy. Irish Catholics embraced this. They went from stages in small public theaters to parish halls, initially in predominantly Irish parishes throughout the city, and then later in suburban parishes, where they were used as a tactic to defend newly settled parish territories against the demise that those initial ancestral parishes back in the city experienced with the arrival of black people. If the parish were under siege by threat of black homeownership, then what better place than the stage of the parish hall to launch counterattacks counter via Irish ballads sung by blackened faces, a space that reminded Irish immigrants and their descendants both of their own embattled entitlements to their home and parishes, as well as the otherness of black people. So what impact did this have on my people? And I wanna bring my people back again. So my grandparents learned, again, since they likely remembered the lessons from the sesqui, that white space needs to be defended by performances of white supremacy. My mother and her siblings surely learned that whiteness, and maybe even Irish American Catholic whiteness, given that the St. Patrick's Day fundraiser was an annual event, automatically belongs, that Irish American Catholicness automatically belongs, particularly in sacred and civic spaces. The minstrel show was held in a parish hall, after all, initially the space where the parish celebrated Eucharist before a formal church building was built, but became the place where social capital was continually generated in the parish. And on that, seventh, that March 17th evening in 1950, financial and social capital got generated as well at the expense of people who are not intended to belong in the parish, in the Burnside States of Development my grandfather was building, in Norristown, in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. These spaces were white territory. Enter them on our terms, not yours. I also found myself wondering how my grandparents squared the parodying of black people in light of their close relationships with two black people who were regular features in their respective landscapes, and therefore the terrain of my mother's childhood. Lillian Bagley, my mother's daily housekeeper from the time my mother was born until well after she graduated from high school, and Horace Davenport, my father's lawyer from the earliest days of his Burnside estate housing project through the end of his life. Lillian attended my parents' wedding. Horace became the first black judge in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. What kind of emotional, moral, cultural pretzels did my grandparents need to twist themselves into in order to justify the anti-blackness performed on the stage of their parish hall, which precluded Lillian and Horace from achieving the very things the Gallaghers wanted for their own family? What is the legacy of that particular knot? Once again, we see that Irish Catholicism is the gold standard, the money-making standard, the legitimacy-granting standard of American Catholicism. Suburban parishes and dioceses like Philadelphia became and remained largely racially segregated as well, given the way that Catholic leaders like Cardinal Dougherty used the federal social welfare program of mortgages for white families to expand white Catholicism into the suburbs while maintaining an urban Catholic presence by channeling minoritized Catholics into parish spaces emptied by that white exodus. As a result, Catholicism in Philadelphia is fragmented by parish territories of insularity and homogeneity, which makes it hard to recognize, much less live, as a multicultural church. And it also leaves Catholics in subsequent generations, like myself, ill-equipped to deal with parish closures and mergers that are breaching some of those racialized territorial boundaries. Had I discovered mom and minstrel time toward the end of my research as opposed to the outset, I don't think that I would have been quite as surprised, but the memory is no less disturbing. 
So in the final moments here, I just want to conclude by offering very briefly some ideas for undoing these knots, and maybe we can come back and develop them a bit more in the Q&A. I think to undo the knot of Irish Catholic entanglement with the history of slavery, we simply need to continue to do the hard work of excavating this history and naming it, whether at the level of parish communities, religious congregations of men or women, or even college uh, universities. The, sayings, the saying goes, you can't change what you can't name. I also think that we need to use our Catholic traditions, and please note the plural here, our Catholic traditions, to create rituals around this process of naming and facing our histories, rituals of memory and of examination of conscience, of healing and reconciliation, of beginning again. These rituals can help us resist the temptation to sidestep these, these histories as having nothing to do with us or using them to blame and shame. We need these histories in order to learn from them, to remember the pain of those who live through them, and to better recognize and redress the afterlife of that pain among people here and now. In terms of the knot of anti-Catholicism, I think we need to be on the lookout for responding to what we don't understand with fear and defensiveness. And we need to identify and reject any politics or pieties that otherize. We need to continue to create ways of expressing unity without uniformity and ever expanding, not contracting solidarity. And I think we also need to acknowledge that Catholicism is not immune to white Christian nationalism and denounce appeals to a racially pure country or church um, or any use of violence as a way of bringing that about. Finally, to undo the knot of territorial Catholicism, we might begin by acknowledging the multiculturalism within the Irish American Catholic community itself. The African American Irish Diaspora Network believes that up to 40% of black Americans could have some Irish roots. If that's the case, then we need to be attentive to the ways in which those Irish Catholic brothers and sisters may not have had the same unfettered access to Catholic spaces and communities as others. How might we, particularly in the, in the spirit of the global synod on participation, communion, and mission, expand the space in our tents to include a wide array, a wide array of cultural expressions of Irish, Irish Catholic culture and create spaces for them to be celebrated too. So I think I'll leave it at that and open it up for, for, some, for some discussion amongst us. So thank you for your, for your kind attention. So it looks like we have a couple, oh, for the recording, yeah. Um. Thanks very much, that, that was really terrific. Um, but it's a, you tell it as an Irish story, and I wonder if you could comment on whether or not it's not just an Irish story, but a Catholic story. I mean, you, the emphasis on Irish mm -hmm. here I don't know if it serves to exculpate the other Catholics, but there's a there's a sense in, uh, of that, I, and I think I don't think that's your intention at all. So that's uh, one question. The other question is how common was it for the anti-blackness to achieve crude public articulation? Because the way I took your presentation uh, was to see a kind of um, osmosis process mm -hmm. from the culture. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether or not there were also moments where, like with Catholic anti-Semitism, where it just gets stated boldly mm -hmm. and crudely. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, really good question. So the book, um, I, I, I do have German and Polish ancestors. Um, and my husband jokes that I was not, f I did not fully disclose that when, 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 we married, when we married because he's very Irish and Catholic, so yes, that's a, um, a little funny bone of contention. Um, but there are, I do have German and Polish ancestors. So the book is, uh, I don't think any of these knots are, are particularly, I've lifted out for the purpose of this talk, some of the Irish dimensions of them. But the list here, I think applies really to, to all American Catholics um, of European descent. Um, at least through my examination of a specific set of parishes based on where my, where my family um, lived and worked and worshiped and went to school and had civic associations and, um, and friendships. So really, I think 
it's it's not something that is germane only to Irish American Catholics. Although it was a great invitation to sort of dig in and try to like wrestle with, well, what were some of the specifically Irish? Um, a place where I found, I mean, there were lots of examples, I think of very like public, bold, in your face statements of racism. It's hard not to think that a minstrel show on St. Patrick's Day in a suburban parish is not, that gets run on the front page of the paper is not in some ways, or maybe not the front page, but makes big headlines in the local paper is not in and of itself its own um, public declaration. But I think the place, at least in my family's history where I found this, um, really explicit was in a Jesuit parish in North Philadelphia that my great grandparents on my father's side, so the same generation as the Gallaghers who I just showed you, um, or no, the Hargadins who were in St. Stephen's around this time of the Sesqui, there was a very concerted effort on the part of the Jesuits of that parish to keep black families from moving into the parish. So far, you know, going as far as having there be uh, racial covenants that folks in the parish were expected to sign and that those were things that were being generated by the parish leadership and then being executed by the lay people and many of them lay women who were going door to door and having people sign. Um, so I don't have, I could, I don't have it in this slideshow, but I could show you the card, right? Of like, here's where we're gonna sign this covenant and we are gonna commit that we are not going to sell our home, rent or sell our homes um, to black families, that this is our territory. Um, and that was the language that um, the Jesuits sort of used in some of their internal communications. Um, and John McGreevy here uh, did a lot of work around that parish in his Parish Boundaries book but I had grandparents, great grandparents who lived on the last street, right? They were on the edge of, of the parish. And so it was a very interesting exercise to wonder what did my great grandparents do? Uh, the whole time I was doing that research, I was worried that we're gonna find the list of the people who signed and I would see Georgia Yeager um, or Sophia uh, Yeager having signed that racial covenant. So yeah, I hope, I hope that, yep. Thank you for the good question. I don't think it was, I, I do think it was in the culture, but there were folks made some active choices and commitments, which is why I said it was not just passively about becoming white, but there were some active choices to, uh, to be anti-black. I just wanted to hear a little bit about um, family history as a method mm -hmm. in the sense that I know there's a pretty important book that came out about a, a French historian that traced a family over 300, 400 years as like a way to tell a huge story. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what you're doing. Um, so I wanted to hear more about that as like a, a method to do history itself. Uh, not necessarily a question of like what this meant for interpersonal relations, but like that would be interesting to hear about too. Like what, how does your family react to this? It's obviously an, an interesting question to pursue, but I'd be mean more, more or less along the lines of like of it as a method itself, saying yes. like looking at this family, it's generations, it's, it's passed through time just seems like a really, it's a, like a really unique and perceptive window to tell the story, so thanks. Yeah, no, thank you for that good question. I mean, in a way you answered the question. So I'm not trained as a historian, so I'm very, um, I'm very much aware of that. Um, and I'm an, I'm an ethicist, although as a history major as an undergrad. So like I do, like I claim a bit of that and I did have a professor who sent me into archives at Georgetown in 19, the fall of 94 to go look at a diary written by a Jesuit, right, about the Jesuits owning slaves. And so like, I do think it was in me, but I ended up going the route of theological ethics. Um, but in that work, I've increasingly been, uh, I've been drawn to community organizing. And I've realized that uh, really good community organizers are very committed to an anti-racist praxis because they recognize that power shows up even in the work of people trying to undo abuses of power. And I think I just was very aware of how I thought that I was on the right track and, and really engaged and understood what was going on and then would have these moments where I was like, oh yeah, I really, I really don't. And I thought I need, I need to figure this out. And I think organizers will tell you story is the most compelling thing that you can do to build power. If you wanna build power with people, you tell your story as honestly as you can and you try to find the places where your story connects with other people's story. 
and where that intersection of your stories might reveal some kind of shared self-interest that leads you towards a direction of, of building power together. And so I think for me, that was the method that I wanted to take. I've taught a number of classes about racism. I've used a ton of scholars of racism. I use a lot of case studies. And all of that is very good and very important. But I found even in my teaching, the most powerful way to get uh, folks in a classroom to move from places of fear and judgment to curiosity would be to ask questions about their own story and to share parts of their own story. So even in my classrooms, sometimes you put like a, a giant piece of butcher block and we like, through the course of the semester, everybody maps their own story onto that timeline. And then as we're learning things, we're adding. Um, so I think it was just wanting to be able to try to understand my family's story. And like all of us have the stories of lore and this, the tall tales and the, and I wanted to learn, I wanted to, I wanted to get deeper than those things. And I, I wanted to, as much as possible, try to empathize with the folks in these different generations. I, I, didn't, I didn't wanna judge them. I didn't wanna let them off the hook in terms of not being honest. And a fair amount of it is conjecture because I just, I don't really know. Um, but even the imaginative exercise of like, well, let's just, let's just imagine what that could be like, I think cultivates a kind of curiosity that we need in doing racial justice work. Because there's so much of it, especially for white people, where we get defensive, where we shut down, where we, we're, we're, not, we're not able to do the work that is ours to do because we don't know how to be curious about our own stuff. So yeah, thank you for that, that good question. And then as for my family, you know, I think, yeah, no, that's fine. I think it's a great, I mean, I, um, I've been, the family members, at least the immediate family members, um, are, are very much, um, were part of this because I did interviews with all of them and I went in, I mean, I didn't, I, these, all these pictures of my grandfather, like none of my, um, you know, the pictures from the, the subdivision, you know, my uncle had these and my mom didn't even know that he had these, right? Like, so um, it was a great way of just gathering material and it gave them an opportunity to start to talk about stuff like, yeah, you know, that's right. Like Lillian Bagley would come with us to the beach, this black housekeeper they had their whole life, came with them to Ocean City, New Jersey, because that's where Philadelphian, Catholic Philadelphians go in the summer. And like my uncle Pat was like, I could never understand why Lillian wouldn't want to come to us, you know, to the beach. And uh, it was because she wasn't really allowed on their beach. There was a black beach that she had to go to, but nobody told him that as an eight-year-old. He just felt like Lillian didn't want to hang out with him. Um, and she might not hang out with him on her day off. But So it just gave them all an opportunity to kind of to share. Um, and, you know, like this is just a small little thing, but I, a cousin, we just were together with some cousins, and... Um, my cousin Nora knows about this work that, my mother's cousin Nora knows about this work that I've been doing and she gave me this medal just over the weekend that belonged to Belinda. And there's Belinda in the middle. And she was just like, I think this medal belongs with you. I think, and I like, so I think it's just been something that has been in many ways sort of liberating for my, for my family. Um, and it's just allowed again, a space of curiosity rather than uh, fear and shame. I answered your question. <laughs> Here comes another, but then we maybe can come back. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this wonderful research and this wonderful presentation. Um, I'm Deacon Mel Tardy. I'm uh, um, academic advisor here, but I'm also the president of the National Black Catholic Clergy Caucus. Oh, wow. And so I, I, um, I think that some of this material will be very uh, interesting to some of the clergy around the country. Yeah. As, uh, you know, that's another story that needs to be written. Um, yes, The yes. story of what they have experienced, uh, we have experienced in formation, seminary, uh, you know, in the diocese, yes. uh, parishes, et cetera. Um, a lot of the things that you mentioned here, um, I was interested in maybe the, the part where you were talking about the minstrel show mm -hmm. um, being a way in which the Irish could sort of, Irish Catholics could sort of have a, get a foothold in um, Americanism mm -hmm. or the sense of, because uh, it seems like this was all during an era when, you know, pre um, John Kennedy, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
becoming president, where there was sort of an inferiority complex for Catholics and, and like you're not really American. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that this speaks to that idea that you can become more American if you be, take on this white nationalism. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you can speak to that just a little bit, if you don't mind, um, just as uh, just to speak to that a little sure. bit. Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I think thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. and, Thank you for your work. And the black is there is a big co con Congress happening in July. Yes, right. Like the the national national black, black Catholic Congress happens yes. every five years. Uh, Daniel Rudd funded it, founded it uh, in the uh, late eighteen hundreds, mid eighteen hundreds. Uh, Father Tolton, who you mentioned, was uh, the presider at the wow. the mass, the first mass. Um, but that was a response to the the fact that it was a, the first lay Catholic movement in the country. Um, because there were no clergy allowed, no black clergy allowed. Yeah. And Father Tolton was the first visibly, recognizably African-American or Negro back then yeah. priest. So um, the erasures that you were talking about and this tendency to sort of downplay involvement by black Catholics, and I would venture to say that it still goes on yes. uh, quite readily in our Catholic diocese uh, in the... Eucharistic revival in the mm -hmm. pro-life movement. In the and it's just like you mm -hmm. don't see black mm -hmm. uh, involvement. It is not necessarily welcomed. And if it is welcomed, it is sort of like it is not done in a way that is um, inviting to people. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I don't want to take away from... No, but I appreciate yeah. you lifting that up and, and sharing that so that yeah. folks in the room know that that's happening. I think it's, it's definitely so happening yeah. now. I can tell yeah. you for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I found that I found this this scholar. I was just going back in my notes. I mean, if you if you really want to dig, the person that I I you know really did turn to to kind of understand the dynamic of minstrelsy was this scholar Nowatowski, um, and I can Robert, ex excuse me, Nowatsky. So N O W A T S K I, um, and he really traces the history of minstrelsy as kind of a distinctive American art form. Um, and, and notes the way that in, in initial minstrel shows, it was both Irish and black people who were parried. And often the parodying that was going on of Irish people, they were in black, they were portrayed as black as well. And it was a real way of signaling or messaging on the part of native Protestants that neither of these groups really belong and that they are more similar to each other in their otherness than they are like us, right? Which is, I think, part of the impulse of, of having, you know, um, parroting Irish people as black. Um, and by the, and that was mostly during the, the sort of the, the antebellum period when there's this like first influx, let's say, a big influx of Irish immigrants. But pretty quickly after that, the Irish kind of took over the minstrel stage and so they sort of said, it's sort of like, well, if we're going to be the people who can talk bad about us, but we're going to continue and, and stereotype and parody us, but we're going to hold on to that piece of, of blackface parodying of black people as a way, again, to signal that we're different from them and we're actually more like you, Protestant, Native Protestant Americans, than we are like these black Americans whose history predates our Irish history in many ways in the country, right? So... It is this very interesting, it is this very interesting power play that happens in improvisation. Um, and another scholar who I did some really, who, who was helpful on this, um, is a scholar who has done some stuff on mummery. So in Philadelphia, as Dr. Cummings knows, there's this very long tradition of, of a mummer's parade on New Year's Day. And it's only in very recent history that blackface has been banned from the Philadelphia mummer's parade. Right? And part of the Mummers Parade was a sort of way of exercising a kind of a vigilantism over the 1st of January, which in black communities is significant because of the Emancipation Proclamation and January 1st, 1963, being the official end of slavery. So in a city like Philadelphia, that you would have some black folks who want to assert their own freedom a mummer's parade can be a pretty nice way of responding to, you know, responding to that, uh, you know, having blackface and mummer's parades. So um, 
it's a, it is a, fa like minstrelsy is a, is a fascinating thing. And I think I find it fascinating that it wasn't just St. Stephen's parish, every parish that I looked in, every parish, I would imagine anybody who's white and Catholic in the room could probably go back. If you had family roots in an urban setting and maybe not even in an urban setting, you will find examples of minstrelsy happening in the parish hall of your, I bet you would maybe find minstrelsy in the yearbooks of Notre Dame. I, I suspect, right? If you go back and look, you would find. Um, so it was, you know, uh, it was a way of a kind of performing. It became a kind of a, a Catholic, um, I don't know, like a kind of a performance of a particular kind of identity. Um, so yeah, thank you for the follow-up question about it. Yeah. It was uncanny. I'm not kidding. I'm not a historian. The first thing I go looking for, I've got is the research leave. And it's like my first day. It's like my first Monday of my research leave. I think I'll go to the Montgomery County Historical Society and get working on this one lead that I think I might be able to track down. And literally, the first piece of microfilm, the first reel is I find this. This, this I didn't even go looking for it. I just thought, OK, there's something here. There's definitely something here, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, and we can talk, we can talk after. Fascinating, that was great. Thank you. Um, my dad, Frank Kelly, was a New York City policeman. Okay. Um, I know he had his racist tendencies, but um, raising us seven children, um, he hit it pretty well. Uh, he was amazing. I wish he was sitting here listening mm. to this. Mm because I would have a lovely conversation with them. I, I and I think you sense. went there, but I'd like you to go just a little bit more. How your fa Is your mom still alive? Mm -hmm. Okay, I would love to hear a little bit more about how your family reacted to this research. Mm -hmm. And uh, Yeah, that's thank you, yep. Um, I mean, you know, I immediately called all of my, you know, I called my Uncle Bill and my mother and said, um, hey, you, you might not remember this, but, but um, do you remember this? I think, again, I think it's just, I, th I think because I am leading with story and I try in the book, like as Dr. Cummings said, like it's not a straight up history book, which I'm sure then makes it, you know, not as thorough and accurate as a history book could be. And it's not just a theological treatise. So it's not just theology that we can use. It's not just ethical principles. Like it's, it is trying to be a blend of many things. I think that my family sort of ex has, continues to experience it as a kind of journey of self-understanding. Um, it's also convenient that some of the folks are not alive, <laughs> right? So I have often thought, like, I would love to have conversations. I would love to have conversations with this, with uh, the Hargadens. Like, I'd love to have some conversations there, especially with Belinda, because Edward died like three or four years after this photo was taken, and she was left with all these kids. Um, I would, I want, I like, you know, or my grand, my great grandmother there in the Jezu. Um, I, I think I've set it up that it is a, a, an ongoing process of spiritual conversion. And I think for many, for Catholics, that's what anti-racism is. It is, a, it is spiritual work. It is spiritual labor. Uh, and that we have a ton of resources in our Catholic tradition that are largely unused that we could be, that we could be using. Um, so one of the things that I reclaimed from an Irish heritage that got handed over um, in order to you know, become white um, was this the Celtic practice of rounding. So a penitential rite in, in sort of Irish Catholicism of the 17th, 16th, and 17th century would be to go find some kind of holy space outside and circumambulate it as part of a, a penitential practice. And so I find that to be something beautiful and beautiful of, you know, from my, from my Irish Catholic heritage. And so that's what I did with these, with these parishes, right? And in some ways invited family members to come along with that. And I'm really grateful and lucky that they, that they, that they have, that there hasn't been this resistance. But again, I think it's because I've tried to lead with story and honor story. Uh, so, yeah, thanks. 
Well, before we thank Dr. O'Connell um, officially, I just wanted to say it, it really is a remarkable book, and we just happen to have some copies available for sale out there. Um, I am a historian, and I can tell you it is very solid archival research, but I think it's also an act of courage to write an, an interdisciplinary book because you do open yourself up to critiques from everybody who says it's yes. too much of one thing and not enough of yes. so. And I also think um, the last chapter in this book is about Catholic higher education, and it talks about... Georgetown and LaSalle. But I also think these are conversations that we should be having more here at Notre Dame. So it's just um, a, an honor for you to, to, to be here and to help us think to begin to think about through some of these issues. So thanks very much. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. O'Connell. Thank